Good morning. Good morning. Education. Well, about, about a year ago, I read this letter that was sent in by a teacher to a national newspaper. In short, it said, I teach history in, uh, in high school, and one of my students got the highest grade for a school exam. So I said to her, well done. How did you prepare for this? And to his astonishment, she said, well, sir, I never studied a book. I never had a look at your PowerPoint sheets, nor did I read your annotations. The only thing I did was watch videos from other teachers. <laughs> Good morning again. <laughs> so I had a look at some of these YouTube teachers, and what struck me was not only the enormous amount of views, but especially the spontaneous comments below these videos, saying things like, well, this video explains things much better than my teachers did in a whole bimester. <laughs> a literal lifesaver. And I, can't, I cannot forget the one saying, my teacher told me that probably I would never learn. Your video showed he was wrong. So I think it was quite courageous of this teacher to send in this letter. And it reminded me of the first job interview I had 35 years ago, I'm that old, when I applied for the first time for a job as a teacher. And one of the first questions in this interview was what my vision was on the use of technology. I didn't have a clue. This is 35 years ago. You know, I was a digital illiterate. I had never touched a computer. So I didn't get a job, and uh, I was overcome by two emotions. The first one was, I was angry. I was angry because I thought I had applied for a job as a teacher, not for a job as a computer scientist. And the second emotion was fear. And I think that if they had told me before that computers were to become an important part of my job as a teacher, I probably wouldn't have chosen the profession. I wanted to be in front of a classroom teaching. So I was, I was anxious. Would technology take over? Would I become redundant or obsolete? And looking back at the letter of this teacher, is this what just happened 35 years later? Did he become redundant and obsolete? Well, believe it or not, but 35 years ago, it was very hard to find a job as a teacher. Now it's the easiest job you can get because we'll lack a lot of them. But 35 years ago, it was very, very difficult. It was even worse. I was classified, and I'm, I'm not kidding, I was classified as an underprivileged job seeker. 35 years ago. So they, they gave me the opportunity to retrain <laughs> and become a computer expert. <laughs> it's, it's, it's almost ironic, isn't it? Um, I didn't like the idea. But given the circumstances, I gave it a try. And I'm glad I did. Because look at how technology has changed our society over the past 35 years. It really changed the way we live and the way we work, doesn't it? And it destroyed complete industries, like the telecom industry. Remember the telephone? Very old-fashioned, isn't it? And remember, for example, the music industry? As a student, I used to buy music records. Remember those? These round things that you put a needle in and play the music. It's very old-fashioned, 35 years ago. It cost me a fortune. And nowadays, I have all the songs in the world available on my smartphone, and I can use the same technology to create my own songs and podcasts and share it with the rest of the world. It has never been more easy to become world famous. So this is what technology did. It brought together demand and supply in a completely new way. That's what it did. But it also changed the definition of what we thought was a music record and was a music store. So seeing this, what is the redefinition of education then? Now, if you look at the way education is managed nowadays, 
Schools, to be honest, pretty much look the same as 35 years ago. And they, they look more or less like a factory, in which you plan people to a predefined schedule of content delivered in the form of lectures, assignments, homework, and tests. Now, I have two problems with this. First of all, content covered is not the same as content learned. But yes, it is an in industrial process. And the second one is, we are all different, and we all learn in a different way. And that's quite difficult to fit in a one-size-fits-all approach that we call schools, that teach to one-size-fits-all exams. That's old-fashioned, isn't it? And I think this is one of the main reasons why today's education encounters so many problems, like high dropout rates, but also very high work pressure for teachers who do their utmost to get everyone past the same exams. But they do two things. Or they get burned out, or they leave. So if you look at this, school organizations have become quite stressful organizations, haven't they? for both teachers and students. And that is not what a learning environment should be, should it? And then all of a sudden, we, has this, we had this incident called the pandemic. Remember that? That could have been the chance of a lifetime, because we were forced to go online. I spoke to a teacher the other day. He said, we were talking about going digital for 10 years, and now we had to do it in two months. And that's what they did. I call this analog digitization. So what we did is we made a copy of the way we were used to work and put the same thing online. Now, this is what happened. I saw my children fall asleep behind the laptops. <laughs> Actually, one of them, the youngest one, if he didn't like the lesson, which was the case quite often, he simply switched off his camera. He really did. He switched off his camera and changed his name into trying to reconnect. <laughs> Leave, leaving the teacher behind, thinking there was something wrong with the internet connection. <laughs> well, there was something wrong. There was something wrong with the connection, but it wasn't the internet. So, it's quite problematic. And we now have the insights. We have the scientific insights, because quite recently, there has been a very big research, an independent research, among thousands of children, students, and their parents here in the Netherlands about their experiences with today's education. And this, this big independent research was done by a foundation called Stichting Oak, and they used the data that has been gathered for years by a platform called ALO. Now, the outcomes are fascinating. Without exception, all children and students wanted nothing more than to go back to school again after the pandemic. That's what they wanted. They wanted to learn. And they wanted to be among the peers. They wanted to meet with friends. It wasn't for the lessons. So that's a bit difficult, isn't it? It wasn't for the lessons. Up to, and I'm not kidding, up to 70% of all children in the Netherlands said that they were bored by the way education is delivered to them, without any ex exception. So now I understand why children cheer if a lesson is cancelled. Now, can you imagine any business in the world where your customers stand up, start cheering, and give a high five if they hear they're not getting delivered? <laughs> but there was more. They wanted to learn other things. I, I read a statement of one of, the, one of the students saying, don't teach me more German, teach me Java, please. And what they ask for is not more lessons, or more lectures, or more books. They want more time from their teachers, more time for collaboration, more time for personal support. That's what they want. And that's what they are used to in the communities they work 
in outside schools. So how about digital transformation then? If I would ask a professor called Sugatra Mitra, he's a very famous professor in England, I admire him very much, he would say, every teacher that can be replaced by a computer should be. Well, that's quite of a statement, isn't it? But what he didn't mean, of course, is that we should get rid of them. On the contrary, we need them more than ever in a world that keeps on changing and demands for lifelong learning. So how come it's so difficult to make those steps? How come? Well, of course, you cannot change a system overnight that has been used for centuries, can you? And we have created laws, levels, regulations around it that stand in the way of change. But we also have to, to take into account that we, we need to meet the expectations of the ones who pay for it. The government and the taxpayers. And I think from that perspective, we should also have a look at ourselves. Because many parents tend to ask from schools that they teach their children in exactly the same way as they were taught, because that's the way they knew it, and that's the way they want it for their children. And if they're not satisfied with the progression, they send them off to homework assistance services, one of the biggest growing commercial markets in the Netherlands, more than 300 million euros per year, mind you. But that's only for the children whose parents can afford it. So what we do is we create a dichotomy in education that we shouldn't want. And that is why I think that school organizations also have to look at themselves. How come they didn't pick up the chance of their lifetime with the pandemic? Is this the best we can do? Is this the best way to spend the precious time and expertise, expertise of our teachers? Is this the best we can do, leaving up the, the damage repair to the, school work, uh, the homework uh, assistance services? When I look at myself, because I did this as well, before I understood what technology could do for education, I used to identify myself as a teacher with the industrial form of it. You know, being a subject matter expert, being in front of a, of a classroom, talking about the subjects I so much love to teach. Look at me now. That's why I didn't see technology as an ally, but as a threat to my profession. Because if an interactive video can replace my lessons better than I do myself, and if AI can generate and mark tests, what is left over of my profession? Well, in fact, the best part, and the most important part, Transformation happens when you have the courage to question the why of what you do and how you do it instead of defending it. And I think this is what education does a lot, defending the existing way of work. And transformation happens when you are prepared to start learning yourself as well. Because lifelong learning also applies to teachers and school organizations. So how do we get there? How do we get there? I think we should go back to the future. And by this I mean that we should combine the best of what we've had so far in education, which in fact are our teachers, and combine it with the best we have created in today's technology. So instead of this, maybe we should create something else. And let me try to give you an idea of how that might look like. If I would ask you, who painted this beautiful portrait, what would you say? A Rembrandt, isn't it? That, that's what you... It's a self-portrait of Carlo Fabricius. It's one of his apprentices. This is a self-portrait of the master himself. Look at the, the way the light is used. Look at the quality of the painting. It's beautiful, isn't it? It's beautiful. This tells us something about 
the learning process that took place between the master and his apprentice. And mind you, this was in a peer-to-peer -peer setting, without any school organization around it, just a peer-to-peer -peer setting. The purest form of learning and the purest form of teaching. Now, the interesting part is this. Today's technology can help us do this at scale. And there are already some great experiments and some great results, results with the early adopters who understand what technology is and what it can do for education. And we have a great edtech community. For example, in the Netherlands, the Dutch edtech community, but we also have a European edtech community that can help us implement this at scale. Because the expertise is there. The technology is there. So we can start today. So this is the paradigm shift we will go through one day. Instead of planning people through a one-size-fits-all process, we can now arrange the learning activities, the learning resources, but also the teachers and the peers around people, around, around children and students and their personal needs. With teachers in the role of their trusted mentors, supported by technology that can help them bring the best possible learning experiences. So, if you are a teacher, I reach out to you, and I would say, don't be afraid of technology like I was, but embrace it, and let it replace the parts of your job that it can do as good as, or even better than you, because it will create the time for you to do the most important part of your job. Helping people further in their personal development. And if you are a school leader, please provide the time and the resources to change your schools in 21st century peer-to-peer -peer learning communities powered by technology. A place where students instead of being a signed off end product, can become the best version of themselves. And a place where teachers, instead of being used as an assembly line worker, can be a Rembrandt again, creating masters out of apprentices. Thank you very much.